Um, <clears throat> it's good to see each of you here today, and uh, hopefully many of you got uh, the card in the mail announcing this new uh, sermon series. And uh, yeah, card in the mail, uh, wrong, <laughs> yeah. Or maybe you got the wrong address, and uh, you know, I, maybe we think you're a member and you're not. I don't know. We could go a long way on that one. But if you are a student right now, I mean, uh, Pierce took a group of, what I count on there, six or seven? Six, well, Baptist count, 12, I mean, yeah, 50 went to across town. But if you're a student, you know what it's like, uh, those of you who have been students, you know what it's like when the teacher comes in and says something like, take out a piece of paper and a pen or a pencil and if you hadn't done your homework or you hadn't done your reading, your heart sinks. And you're like me, you're, there goes my C minus. <laughs> Why? What? Why today? Not today. Oh, but the book of James is not a pop quiz or a test. But he does offer some very straightforward advice. One author or commentator I read this week said that it shows you how old, you have to be old enough to remember Dragnet. Some of you who have white in your hair remember Dragnet. Sergeant Joe Friday, when he's interviewing a witness or whatever, eventually he will say, just the facts, ma'am, just the facts. James is very much just the facts. Some have called it a manual on practical Christianity. Almost a how-to book of faith. Critics of James will point out the fact that he seldom speaks of Jesus or how he seems on the surface to appear to be contradicting Paul in his discussion about you are saved through faith. Talking about the line where he talks about show me your works and I'll show you your faith or show me a faith that has no works and I'll show you a dead faith. But rather than debate these points, let's accept that this is the wonderful word of God inspired by him, written by the half-brother of Jesus. Now, <clears throat> James, the brother of Jesus, did not believe in his brother as the Messiah until after the resurrection. And I did make sure that in each pew there are those little pads that have the church logo on it, so if you'd like to have a pop quiz, I did this to one, to, actually I've done this to almost every preacher friend of mine as I have been preparing for this discussion or this sermon series on James. You don't have to, it, no one's going to turn these in, but just for fun, write down all the names of Jesus' brothers. It's in the Bible. It's in there. You know, I, it's in there somewhere. Yes, I can tell you exactly where it is. Because I had to learn them myself because I thought, well, James, I know James, but if you go to Matthew 13, verse 55, it's going to talk about how they are, who is this crazy brother of ours, if you will? They were not believing in him. And they will list James. They will list Judas. Anybody else? Joseph and Simon. So maybe not in that order, but typically James is always the first one mentioned. Whereas most commentators will say that's probably because he was the oldest. As you name your children, usually, you know, if you're going to tell everybody who, who your kids are, you start usually with the oldest. Paul tells us that Jesus appeared to his brother James in 1 Corinthians 15, 7. We see that. That he appeared not only to Paul and the apostles, but his brother James. So we think it's somewhere at that point, perhaps that was his conversion. But we know that James, the half-brother of Jesus, would go on to be the leader of the church in Jerusalem. In fact, he would be credited by Paul on more than one occasion in the scriptures. And he's referred to often as James the uh, just or James the one of honor because he was known to be a man full of holiness. This letter... If you're going to date it, this is typically what you will do in any kind of exegetical rec work. And those in my office know I have really enjoyed getting into the book of James. I've preached James. I have done you know, an old movie. And you, you look at it. You go, man, I didn't notice it the last time. Or, oh, man, I love this line when this line comes out. But James was martyred uh, in about 65 A.D. 
And most uh, biblical scholars think that this book was written prior to the council in Jerusalem. So, and I think that's around 49 or 50 AD. So many will credit this book or given a, a dating of this book of about 45 or 46 AD, making it the first book written in the New Testament, which most of us, well, I didn't know that. I thought the gospels were written first. Well, another little gem to take away from today. James is writing to a Jewish Christian community scattered across the lands. He talks about the Greek word is the diaspora, those who are dispersed, the, the, the children of the 12 tribes scattered amongst the land. And his practical guidance is offered to help them as they face the battles of life. His words will often sound like his brother Jesus. In fact, many of you will find similarities as we work our way through this book uh, in James and Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, a lot of practical advice. And if you're like me, often when you get something for your kids or you get something for yourself, you discard the instructions and go about building it yourself. This is one set of directions, one set of instructions that we all need to read. Welcome to the book of James. And as I told uh, Pierce and Dan this morning, because I, I got out my Greek Bible and looked it up again, I'm like, I can't believe, yep, how did I, never, how did I not see that? Turn in your Bibles to the book of Pierce, we said Jacob. Because in Greek, James is Jacob. So if I had said, turn to the book of Jacob, half of you would be flipping till the 12 o'clock hour. But turn to James. We will talk about a faith that works, a faith that will be tested. All right, here we go. I'm only going to do, I was originally going to do 12 verses today, and I thought, I can't get past verse 4. James, a servant of God. Greek word, doulos, slave of God. And of the Lord Jesus Christ. Some will say, why did he split those two words? Why didn't he just say a servant of God implying the Trinity? Well, we're reading it with 2,000 years of experience. And he's identifying his brother Jesus as the Messiah. I am saying I am a servant of God's. And oh, by the way, my brother was the Messiah. Just so you know. In fact, some say, why didn't he say who he was? Well, if you're Jesus' brother, they knew who James was. James was Jesus' brother, and, and that's the end of the story. So he goes from there. To the 12 tribes scattered among the nations, common Greek greeting and letter, or introduction and letters, greeting. That's all he says, greeting. Greetings. Verse 2. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Because you know the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. And that's where we'll end today. Pray with me, please. Our Father, as we look at this passage, that it tells us to be joyful in the midst of our trials. Nearly impossible for most of us to consider. Speak to our hearts. Let us look at the words that James has given to us, this practical advice, advice this how-to, if you will, to apply our faith, a faith that works, Lord. As we're in the season soon of spring, may we spring into a faith that works. Hear this, Lord, for we ask it in the name of Jesus, the Savior, our Savior. Amen. So, as we consider this passage, and if you, I mean, we could spend a lot of time just on the first verse, but I want us to skip immediately. I mean, I'm not skipping it. He's writing to the 12 tribes. I tried to give you an introduction to that. Uh, the 12 patriarchs are referred to, if, it, if you look at Revelations, are referred to the 12 there. There's an implication some commentators see that James is implying the end of times already. Being the first book, book in the New Testament, he's already talking about the fact that Jesus is coming back by using this 12 tribes language, but he says greetings, and then he goes immediately to this in your face, and this is where I'm going to get my first point, adjust your attitude for joy. Trick, strictly chasing a rabbit because it comes to mind every time. My dad would tell me as a state trooper who was never promoted in 36 years until he got ready to retire, and they gave him one of these kind of like timing grade promotions. He had a sergeant tell him one time, Trooper, if we could just get your attitude adjusted, 
you'd be very successful. He looked at him, he said, Dad would always say, well, my wife hasn't been able to adjust my attitude in 30 some odd years. I don't know if you can either. If we will adjust our attitudes for joy and faith, you might just find yourself a little more joyful. Ken Hughes, in his commentary that I picked up this week, says of this first phrase, Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds. He says, well, how nice, I quote, a letter of encouragement from Pastor Wacko. Don't worry, be happy. Well, many of us would be a little slow to call James Pastor Wacko. We might question his advice on the practical and realistic expectation that when you're going through trials, you might say, meet them all with joy. It may work for the little irritations, like the guy cuts you off in traffic. Traffic. Be happy, be joyful, you have a car and you have brakes. But is it realistic when we're facing the huge trials in life that hit us? How do you say to a parent of a terminally ill child, meet it all with joy. Consider it pure joy as you face these trials. How do you say it to the widower who's just lost the love of their life? Consider it all joy. How do you say it to the spouse who has been betrayed? Consider it all joy. We can bring it down to everyday living after this past week. How do you say to the person who is trying to fix a broken pump for their well, broken pipes in their house, they have no money, perhaps the COVID has impacted their job, that's living paycheck to, to stimulus check to whatever they can get. Consider it all joy. Well, let's first consider our modern word, of joy and how we use it compared to happiness. We use it almost synonymously, right? Although I don't think I say joyful very often. I asked Brenda, I said, we said it uh, in Christmas songs, Joy to the World. And then she starts singing Three Dog Night. <laughs> Different Joy to the World. Those of you who are a little older can appreciate that. But we often use those two words interchangeably. <clears throat> Some say that happiness is internal, while joy is external. And others see joy in you as you go along. And that implies what you're to possess here. And as I, when I read that definition, I thought, great. One more way to look at Christians being two-faced. Being one thing to the world, but inside totally different. I can remember as a kid, we sang that, Sunday school vacation Bible song, I got the down in, where? Yeah, you got it. Down in my, and eventually down in my heart to what? Stay. Stay. Amen. Thank you, Mike. Somebody's paying attention still. Got to love that. Consider then this word. Let's not get hung up so much on joy. Let's consider the word consider. Verse 2, consider, it can be translated way. It can be translated think. Which denotes a careful and deliberate judgment stemming from external proof with no subjective judgment based on feeling. So it becomes a non-feeling type of word. James says we will have trials. King James says temptations. Actually, if you could read the original Greek, which I barely can, he plays on different Greek words twice. He says, you know, greetings. He uses a word that we get grace, keros from. And he also says joy, which is another variation of that same word. And then in trials, he uses the same variation of a word that he uses for temptation. Now, trials cannot separate us from the love of God. If I remember Paul's account from Romans, what, about eight? For neither, you guys look that one up because I'm not going to quote quoting for you. Romans 8, 38. He was convinced that nothing can separate us from the love of God. So we need to adjust our attitude to meet the trials so joy may come. And that won't be easy because you still will have pain. You still will have unexpected trials and they will not be easy. When someone hits me, I want to strike back. When I'm angry, my family, or when I'm hungry, my family knows I get grouchy. When my emotions are raw, I do not act and talk and live like Jesus. 
James says, adjust your attitude for joy. So back to the weight thing. And I, this is a very simple one. Remember scales, the scales of justice, right? You know. How many ever went to, am I that old? I'm trying to think. Maybe that was in high school science where they actually had little weights that you put on something and you weighed things. All right, total, I'm going to chase a squirrel. I can remember senior year, I had this one government teacher that I really liked. He was also uh, one of the football coaches, or had been. And he said, I'm going to give you nine pennies. One of them is heavier than the other eight. I'm going to give you a set of scales. And you can only use the scales twice. I want you to determine how you'll find the heaviest penny. Think about that one as I go on. So, and I'll tell you after church if you want to know. But if cancer, if a disobedient child, the finances of the world are on this hand, but I have salvation on this other hand, eternity in heaven, surely in anyone's mind, if you understand who Christ is, it outweighs anything, any trial And you have a reason to adjust your attitude for joy. Nothing that this world gives me can take of knowing that I have a redemptive experience through Jesus Christ. And I will expend eternity with him because of my faith in him. Adjust your attitude for joy. Second, trials of faith produce endurance. Trials of faith produce endurance. If I had you take out that piece of paper again, and you could turn it over this time, uh, instead of trying to write the names of Jesus' brothers, and I ask you to write down all the things that are happening to you right now that you consider to be a trial. I mean, what would you write down on there? I don't, you know, wouldn't have to read them out loud, but it could be the bills that have come in. It could be the kids. It could be the job. It could be the car. Let's say bills again. It could be all the problems of having no power or no, no water in the past few weeks. It could be your in-laws. Nobody said amen. It could be your, it could be outlaws. I mean, you're afraid of crime. You're afraid of drugs or in your own life. You're afraid of alcohol, the effects of that. You're afraid of how you might be tempted with pornography. And there I'm getting to use the word tempted versus trial. It could be these different things that could be a long-winded preacher. I don't know. But James is telling us that we will face trials and testing. And because of that, your faith develops perseverance. The word actually means behind, left behind, steadfast, solid, immovable. Well, today I brought in, in fact, let me, let me, I'll back up. Because you notice the whole theme, Pierce found these slides, I think they're really cool. I even have a blue collar shirt on today, you know, uh, to go along with working. Uh, I'm going to invite anybody from week to week. You've got to give it to me at least three days in advance. If you have a tool that you think is very unique and no one I'm looking at Keely. You could bring in a dental tool. Nobody would know what that is. But uh, you could bring in a tool of your trade or just a tool. Maybe you collect antique tools. I know Wayne Mars does. And I will try to work it into a sermon uh, in some way. But this particular one uh, is, uh, was borrowed uh, by Dean Howard for me because I asked him if he knew uh, what this uh, fancy word was. And now, Dean, I think I forget. It's Betsometer, right? The, 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 yeah, I don't even know how you pronounce it. But, and I showed it to, to Wade earlier. Of course, Wade works with tools and knows how to get around with a toolbox. He said, well, it's obviously measuring pressure. And what you would do with this particular device is on... Let me show you this next picture. That was my airplane and Brenda's airplane when I uh, pastored in Illinois before I came in the Air Force. Show the next wing. It's a 1946 Air Coupe, 75 horsepower. (laughs) Man, we can go fast. About 105 mile an hour and about five gallons of gas an hour. And it burned car gas, which I didn't have the STC to do. But, you know, a lot of guys did that. Uh, And as most uh, ladies who have husbands that have airplanes, at some point, they will either watch you wash the airplane or tell you that you missed a place. And Brenda's there helping me wash it. But those wings, you see it's a little shinier towards the uh, uh, ailerons, that's metal. The the fuselage is all aluminum, but the wings are fabric. And what do we say, Dean, is this acceptable? 56? Goes down to 56 pounds. It's not really foot, I don't know, whatever. I'll make it up. It's foot pounds, okay? And I can do that to my hand. It leaves a really nice mark. 
And if you hear, boom, it pokes the hole, poked a hole in it, it is time to get new fabric on your airplane. And of course, any uh, airplane owner would hate to have that happen because that means some serious dollars. And uh, if you were getting ready to buy an airplane, you'd probably want to have somebody test it because you would rather have the guy selling it to you fix it before you buy it. Um, but when fabric needs to be replaced on an aircraft, wouldn't it be far more to your advantage to have it happen on the ground than airborne? And the fabric starts peeling off or you have lost the ability for it to remain in the air because the fabric is gone. And trials like those that you might write on a piece of paper will test your faith. Will you rely on your faith to survive the punch of 56 pounds or more? Because I tell you, some of us, our faith or our faith in ourselves is paper thin. I can't even bust this one. This is a pretty strong paper. There it is. We believe in ourselves. We believe in our possessions. We believe in our emotions. And life punches through frequently. Well, the beauty of it is that God is in the restoration business. And he will apply new linen, new cloth to your frame. He will replace your heart. Won't just patch your heart. Because I know back in the day they would patch some. In fact, you might have seen a guy with duct tape over a small place on his plane. God wants to create in you a new heart. And as I told Dean this morning as I was trying to talk my way through how I might use this device... Um, the, the guy that I flew a lot with when I had that airplane uh, had a Taylor Craft. It was a, a fabric-covered covered airplane. I don't think it had any metal on it. Um, tail dragger, first time I ever got to fly an airplane with a trail, tail dragger, and it will make you into a totally different pilot, uh, much better. But I can't say that I was that proficient. I could get up and down and, and walked away from it. But um, he did some uh, fabric work on, on another aircraft. He was a, an a, a and P um, uh, mechanic. And that you smoke, but dope. That at that time there was even but what was it, Dean? But but starts with a B, but, but it was um, a, like a lacquer. And now Dean's tell me they make it now that are water, water soluble, probably far more friendly to the environment. But when you put that chemical on the cloth, it stretches and hardens. It becomes watertight, airtight, and it's amazing that putting that chemical on it. And I said. If I, th if I continue on with this airplane illustration, not only will God give you a new robe to wear, he will wash that robe with the blood of Christ. And it makes our lives not impervious to pain, but it makes it to where those in the side of faith and salvation than anything the world can bring upon us. Christ's blood is that which covers our sins and strengthens us to survive. When we consider endurance, think of it this way. If you were going to run a 10K race, you would start by running 5Ks and maybe work your way up to a 10K. But if you're really wanting to be competitive, you're going to end up running more than a 10K. That way, when you run the 10K race, it's, it's easier because you've been running 15 or you've been running 20 or something like that. And with us, when we understand that a trial of our faith produces endurance... It's those things that challenge us. It's those things that, it doesn't mean it's going to be less painful, but you will understand that I can find and adjust joy in the midst of the trials of my faith because it produces perseverance and endur endurance. Finally, as we look at this passage, work. Let me back up and read, because I, I hate it when you, I don't give you enough of the, what I was trying to talk about. Maybe you still missed it. Verse 2, consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds. That was that idea that you need to adjust your attitude for joy. Because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. That's the idea, that second point. Perseverance may finish its work so that you may be mature. King James will say perfect and complete, not lacking anything. Well... Obviously, none of us here will ever be perfect. That's why I like the more modern translations to say that perseverance, this idea of being tested, will produce maturity. And oh, that we would all grow in faith towards spiritual maturity. But it is a process. It's a process. And I think it's a never-ending process.
God's goal for all of us is Christ-likeness, spiritual maturity. Tony Evans uh, talked about this in one of his recent uh, posts on, on the internet. And he said, attaining spiritual adulthood is the process of God training us to consistently live from the perspective of the spirit rather than the perspective of the flesh. Maturity in Christ includes looking at and reacting to things from a spiritual perspective, not through the eyes of natural man. Lord, help my eyes to mature. Let me go on a whole side note on that. Brenda and I joke all the time, as you get older and you start picking up the bifocals, it's so you won't see the hair growing on the other person's ears. God is kind as he matures our eyes. Well, let him mature our eyes of faith. Some of you may have heard of Philip Yancey. He's a Christian writer. Um, he wrote a book, I think it's published first in maybe 89 or 90, called Disappointment with God. I would, I would, any book I tell you that if, it's, it should be a decent read for you. Uh, he started about writing that with a plan that he would talk to all these people who have been disappointed by their faith, that the faith process had not worked out right for them. And in the course of writing the book, as he uh, shares this, he had interviewed trying to make references to Job. And those of you who know the story of Job, had all these things, had this wonderful life, family, possessions, and they're all taken away from him. And how he deals with that is a pseudonym for him. But um, Doug, his profession was some type of Christian counselor, psychoanalyst, I think is what he really was. But he had left a very lucrative job and moved to uh, a less urban area to uh, produce and, and, and to counsel with folks uh, about their faith. So knowing that, it helps me understand how he could say what he would say when finally questioned by Yancey. But uh, Yancey sets up the story that this man, Doug, his wife had already had breast cancer and had, had surgery for that. Uh, the cancer had come back and was in her lungs now. And one night in the midst of this whole crisis situation, they are driving and their car is hit uh, head on by a, a drunk driver. His wife, who was already sick with her cancer, uh, was not harmed. His 12-year-old daughter's arm was broken. And Doug uh, had what we would call, because this book is that old, we would call now a traumatic brain injury. Um, when he did recover, his wife basically had nothing from the accident other than her ongoing cancer. Uh, the girl's arm healed, but Doug... Uh, had headaches from then on, never knowing when they would come. He had uh, problems with his eyes. One eye w was always wandering. He could not focus. In fact, view him and ask him how he felt and how he, what he did when he was disappointed with God. Book and tells that uh, he had just found out earlier, because they obviously were friends, that uh, Doug's wife had found that the cancer had returned the week prior to their interview. And let me read some of this to you just verbatim. He, he says to him, um, Could you tell me about your own disappointment in God? What have you learned through this that might help someone else through a difficult time? Doug was silent for what seemed like a long time. And as he stroked his gray beard and gazed off, <laughs> Yancey inserts, I thought maybe he was having a headache or couldn't get his eyes to focus again. He finally speaks, and I quote, To tell you the truth, Philip, I didn't feel any disappointment with God. End quote. Shocked by his answer, Yancey waited for him to explain, and this is what he said. The reason is this. I learned first through my wife's God with life. Hang on now. He said, I'm no stoic. I'm a, as upset about what happened, the unfairness, the accident, I want to grieve, I, I want to express my anger, but I believe that God feels the same way about the accident that I do. Grieved and angry. I don't blame him for what happened. I have learned through this beyond the physical reality and think of his world in a spiritual reality. In other words, we think life should be fair because God is. Well, no, God is over all things, but life will bring you trials and, and testings. He said, expecting that life will always be good, just like God is good to me, is expecting yourself to set, or setting yourself up for disappointment. 
Let me go on and I'll close out what he says. He says, God, God's existence, even his love for me, does not depend on my good health. Frankly, I've had more time and opportunity to work on my relationship with God during this time with my eye and my head. And he went on just to change the way Yancey was even thinking about writing this book. And he said, you know, they've been talking, been drinking coffee, and finally he catches sight of what time it is. And Doug says, I got to go. He said, but leave, let me leave you with this one of Jesus. Was life fair for him? For me, the cross demolished for all time the basic assumption that life will be fair. If the Son of God could be crucified who knew no sin, life is not fair. So we should be able to shout with James, count it all joy. Because my Savior has overcome the world. My Savior has offered and continues to offer me grace, forgiveness, love, and mercy. My Savior will be welcoming me into paradise someday. Working at maturity of our faith as we continue to work through this book of James. So today, how have you expressed joy in your life? How have you faced the trials of this life? And are you growing in your faith? Stand with me, please, we pray. Father, as we have now a time of invitation. If there's someone here, Lord, who wants to come to the front as we get ready to sing a song, it won't stop the trials of this world. But surrendering their life, surrendering their heart, allowing you to create a new heart, to be clothed with new robes, to allow the blood of Christ to pour over us for our forgiveness of our sins. Lord, that will bring joy. So whatever decision that needs to be made today, maybe someone just needs to come to these steps and pause and pray and say, Lord, take from me this trial. Or even better yet, Lord, help me get through this trial because of my faith in you. This is our prayer. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.